So welcome to everybody to this session dedicated to the L'Aquila earthquake. As, as you know, severely hit the L'Aquila town in central Italy, and where unfortunately more than 300 people died. And just the main reason why we would like to, we, we wanted to organize this special session is just to discuss uh, with the whole uh, scientific community the main outcomes of these large normal faulting earthquakes that uh, for, and this very interesting high quality data set and that for Italy for the first time it include also near field uh, GPS observations and uh, just a quick reminder for uh, the speakers that uh, um, we will advise them after 12 minutes standing up from the desk so they can recognize the timing. There's also a clock here on the desk. And uh, please, if you can, leave a couple of minutes for a question. So uh, let's start with the first speaker of the day, and uh, is Alberto Michelini. The, the work is uh, Maggi and Michelini. Continuous waveform data stream analysis detection location of the L'Aquila Airquist sequence. Okay, thank you. I would like to thank the organizers of uh, this session for giving us the possibility to present this work. This is still in progress. And uh, I have subdivided the talk into five different parts. I will first address the problem, then the data, the technique, application to the L'Aquila sequence, and then some summary and conclusions. So the main problem that we have faced during the L'Aquila sequence, but this is common to most of the sequences, that uh, uh, one of the big challenges of modern seismology is the extraction of tectonic information from large volumes of continuous waveform data. Fast and efficient procedures for detecting seismic transients can be extremely valuable when qualifying large, high-quality data volumes. So for the L'Aquila earthquake, it's available a large, high-quality data volume which makes the analysis intractable when adopting standard analysis techniques based on manual analysis, or even when using standard monitoring techniques. In general, we seek techniques capable of exploring fully and rapidly the broad spectrum of seismic signals contained in continuous waveform volumes. So L'Aquila data set. So within 100 kilometers of the epicenter, we had 25 permanent broadband stations plus tw about 20 temporary extended short period stations. So the total is about 125 gigabytes for 25 days of operation of, uh, that we have analyzed. So this is just a quick look at the data. This is a 35 minutes data example. So then we zoom in into the windows that are shown there. So you see the incredible number of earthquakes that have been recorded. You can also see some of this, uh, the data that have been recorded by the local stations and those of the uh, National Broadband Permanent Station. So the technique. The technique is a continuous, we, what we do is a continuous correlation between incoming data streams and a set of Green's functions. Each grid point is tested as a potential event hypocenter, and its likelihood is given by the sum of the correlations between data and Green's functions. So the approach is not new. The approach has been proposed by Wieders et al. 1999 at local scale, based on earlier work by Shearer 1994. Ekstrom used the deconvolution rather than cross-correlation. And uh, uh, similar ideas have been used also by Kawakatsu for moment tensor inversion, Auger, and Tsuroka. But 
the basic idea can be really dated back to mail 1886, and it's similar to the strip method that you can find in Richter 1958 book. And the earthworm associator within the binder module is also similar ideas. So this is uh, basically the method. This is an example where you have basically an earthquake, E1, and then you have these three recording stations, and then you have two uh, different potential points where the earthquake could be located. And clearly what you will have here between the recorded data and the PNS travel times, the, the point G1 would be a much better location. So just uh, to remind you what, how the method works, and what you will see in one of the movies that I'll show later, this is basically what happens. It, there is a, this continuous correlation between the pre-processed data and the Green's functions. And so there are these circles that basically start at each one, whenever one station records a, a, an arrival. And this goes on until you locate the earthquake where there is the maximum correlation level. So the nice feature of the method is basically you don't need any picking and you just analyze the data. So these are the uh, station location and the grid has been used. The grid is uh, three kilometer spacing and you can see the permanent station which are, say the, the, the stations are you know, further away from the main shock area and the local stations are all nearby the, uh, the fault. So this is some data preparation has been uh, applied. So what you do, you get the, the data, continuous data, you uh, downsample, you eliminate the gaps, you align the, all the different uh, uh, data, and then you apply the pre-processing. The pre-processing, what we used is the kurtosis. The kurtosis uh, has a nice feature, so it really evidences what are the uh, first arrival energy of the earthquakes. So this is just an idea of the kurtosis preprocessing on all the stations for this particular 35 minutes window. Uh, on the right, you find the basically P arrival times boxcar, uh, we call, say, in a simplified manner, Green's functions. So this is the picture that I showed you earlier. And here what you see on the top row, what are the maximum correlation levels that uh, are uh, detecting the different earthquakes. Clearly this depends on the threshold level that you apply and different detection levels you will obtain. So this is basically the same picture I showed you earlier in the previous one. And here to each one of these peaks it's associated a map of the correlation, and you see the, uh, the red area indicate where the location of the earthquake is. A better idea of what's going on can be seen in this movie, where you actually see on the bottom the actual time proceeding and the earthquakes in here. Anytime you have a larger peak, you basically get uh, an earthquake location. So this is Overall, uh, a nice feature of the method that doesn't need any picking, it just goes on and you can analyze quickly very large set of data. So uh, in the next few pictures, I will show you some of the uh, little statistics we've done when we have compared the results of our analysis with the, uh, what we call the EasyTech catalog, which is the uh, catalog list, the earthquake list that comes out of the INGV Seismic Center. So what you see here, and we have plotted basically our, uh, the associated events, and the size of the circles is uh, proportional to the magnitude and the color scale instead indicates how different is the location from those that are reported in the easy catalog. So one thing I, I, I want to say is that we have analyzed the whole sequence but the first half hour which needed uh, some special uh, different uh, setting of the parameters but nevertheless on the backdrop of this slides, you will see there is a, we locate easily also the location of the main shock. Okay, so this is a, what we call the non-associated events. On the left, you have those events that have been missed by uh, our program that's named WaveLock, 
And this is uh, basically there are about uh, uh, th uh, a little bit more than 300 events. Uh, on the right side, you see all the other events that are not uh, present into the uh, EasyDay catalog. Clearly, what we see here is that there are some larger events that have not been detected by the uh, INGB Seismic Center for various reasons. I can answer later. And, uh, um, and then and the circle is proportional to actually the value of correlation. So you have large values of correlations that actually clearly went undetected. So here what we've done, we basically on the left, we show the uh, magnitude, local magnitude of the associated event versus cross, the, cross, the, the, the correlation peak. And what you see here is there is generally uh, a, a correlation between the, 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 the value of the peak and the magnitude. Oh, the same information is on the right is shown for uh, the distances that we have between the uh, easy the catalog and the uh, wave lock detected earthquakes. What you see is that basically the, all the larger events down to magnitude three or so, they're generally quite well located. On the other hand, this is uh, this is what I want to stress, it's not general, I mean, this method is not really for location, but more for really detection of events. So this is, uh, there are this, these are the differences for what concerns the origin time. They are centered around zero or so. And uh, here it's what concerns uh, the actual differences that you find in the epicentral location between easy day and wave lock for uh, different depths of earthquakes. So basically, what you see here is that you can get green, I mean, a pretty good location regardless of the actual depth of the earthquake, at least for epicenter. So this is the, uh, what I would say, the, the, the final picture we have. Uh, it is, this is for, uh, on the left, we have the uh, association of the, uh, with the, um, easy the catalog, and what we find is for magnitude, which is slightly greater than 2.2, we basically detect all the earthquakes. And, uh, uh, but uh, as I anticipated earlier in one of the previous pictures, what we see is that there are also a number of events that went undetected, and this method was actually capable to detect. So we come to the uh, summary and the conclusions. So WaveLock is a modification of the local waveform correlation event detection system that has been proposed by Withers. And uh, it can be used for the analysis of large volumes of continuous waveform data, but also, in principle, can be used for real-time processing of, and for ver to obtain very rapid uh, uh, locations without any waveform picking. The analysis of the first 25 days of the L'Aquila resulted in the detection of about 16,000 events for a magnitude threshold, which is around magnitude greater than 0 0.5. And uh, nearly all the earthquakes greater, magnitude greater than 2 listed in the uh, Seismic Center catalog uh, were correctly detected. And uh, what we found is some additional 10% or so events with, with, within magnitude 2 point two and three were also not listed and detected. The entire analysis has been carried out on a 512 CPU cluster and it takes on the order of 40 minutes, which is really very, very short time for an, for an analysis of such a big data volume. And uh, what I would like to stress, this procedure is the first module of a more general procedure aimed toward the detection of transient seismic phenomena for large volumes of continuous wave from data. And there is a project which is called VERCHE that has been just submitted to the EC for funding. Thank you. Time for a quick question. There was a question about how we uh, calculate magnitudes in your uh, method. We don't, uh, uh, right now we don't uh, really calculate magnitude. 
because uh, uh, I mean magnitude you could calculate it if you look at the regression we did between the maximum of the correlation and the uh, and the local magnitude. But really, what I think that uh, would be effective is once you have detected the earthquake, you calculate magnitude with standard methodologies. Okay, thanks very much. We'll move on to the next talk, which is an invited presentation on real-time operative uh, earthquake forecasting in the case of the Lacula sequence. It's by uh, Marzocchi and Lombardi, and Marzocchi will be giving the presentation. Okay, the, good morning to everyone. Uh, the goal of this presentation is to show you uh, one aspect of the operational earthquake forecasting capability that we have right now in Italy. In particular, uh, the short-term forecasting that we have made just immediately after the, the main shock. Let me, let me introduce briefly what, what is the meaning of operational, why would we have to add operational. Just because um, operational earthquake forecasting is the process of providing communities with authoritative information about the time dependence of seismic hazard that can be used for decision making. I have taken this definition by uh, a recent work of the International Commission of Earthquake Forecasting for Civil Protection, led by Tom Jordan. And now, before, before talking a little bit in detail about what we have done, let me, let me summarize the virtue of operational earthquake forecasting. At the beginning, I thought, oh, maybe it's just a mere application of, of models. No, it's not true, absolutely not true. Epistemo epistemology teaches us that the real knowledge is when you can say something correctly, possibly, obviously, before an event, not after. Another important point that is quite clear is that operational earthquake forecasting may affect society. And another point that is really important to me is an, an, an excellent scientific tool. Just because it's a good tool to verify reliability and scale of models, we have many information, many physical parameters, many physical and statistical models to make earthquake forecasting. When we run these codes in real time, like for instance made in the, in the collaboratory studies for earthquake predictability, we can learn a lot about what, what what parameters are really relevant for making a good job in earthquake forecasting? Now, some introductory issues. In the next presentation, we, you will learn a lot about L'Aquila earthquake, and I will not talk about exactly what happened for the main shock, but I will focus my attention about what we have done immediately after. Basically, earthquake forecasting is, is available at different time scales, short, mid, and long term, and the, this, this distinction is very important because any, each, each kind of uh, forecasting is primarily based on the practical utility of the forecast. Long term is very important to define, for instance, building code like in seismic hazard. Mid term is very important to intensify some uh, action, for instance, uh, intensify the vulnerability check of the, the public buildings to reinforce some buildings in the... Um, that are particularly vulnerable from a seismic point of view. And for the short term, we are talking about uh, days or one week. It could be important also for, for taking some action, in particular after the occurrence of a large event. The most important earthquake forecast, op or operational earthquake forecasting model is the hazard map. Let me show you briefly how it worked for L'Aquila earthquake. This is the seismic hazard map for Italy. L'Aquila earthquake occurred just here in the violet, violet area. The observed acceleration peaks are in general agreement of what expected by a hazard map. There are few peaks of 0.7G close to L'Aquila, and they are very likely uh, due to site effect and also effect 
because the faults were really, really close to the city, and this caused most of the damages. This is one of the reasons for what we had so many damages. Before L'Aquila earthquake, the only operational earthquake forecast in Italy was the other map, and uh, some alternative long-term models. But uh, now, just with this experience, we have uh, provided some new additional hazard map and an additional operational earthquake forecasting model in the, sh in the short term perspective. Sorry. And this is the first time that we have applied that in Italy. Uh, let me summarize the model. The model is uh, one flavor of the ETHOS model. The ETHOS model is very is represented by this equation. It is, uh, the equation looks like very difficult, but the, the basic principles are very simple. We have a tectonic, uh, we have a background that is constant in time and can vary with space, and this is the triggering part. It means that any earthquake can trigger a uh, subsequent earthquake depending on the magnitude with the time behavior, and this is the space behavior. And uh, this produces some sort of expected number of earthquakes. If you want to expect a number of earthquakes per specific beam of magnitude, you have to link this equation to the, to the Gutenberg-Richter law. This catalog contains many parameters. All parameters have been calculated using the seismicity before April 4, therefore before the main shock occurred. And uh, these parameters are reported here and uh, were kept fixed during uh, the aftershock sequence. This is the uh, learning catalog, and this is the uh, map of the background seismicity. Very important to remind all the parameters were calculated using the seismicity before the main shock. And this is what we have prepared starting from April 7. This is just an example. This is um, the probability, daily probability map for uh, earthquake. This is reported the rate of events expected for magnitude 4. Here we, are, we reported also the probability for a magnitude 4 and magnitude 5 in the whole area. Here we have reported the, all the earthquake occurred to produce the forecasting map. And here, the same forecasting map, and in blue are reported the earthquake that really occurred during the forecasting time windows. Therefore. This is the real forecast. The map has been produced using the earthquake that are reported here, and the blue one are the earthquake that really occurred after the release of earthquake forecasting map. This is a movie reporting the first 40 days of force shock. Okay. In, in this movie, you will see the map, and immediately after that, the blue dots that represent the earthquake that really occurred. Obviously, this map depends on time. The intensity of the colors is some way re related to the uh, probability of occurrence. And uh, the basic point here is that we were able to identify in some way uh, what, what is the region that were most dangerous for that days. And uh, we will not uh, see all the maps that we have produced. We have produced map like that until uh, the end of October. We have also reproduced well the increase of probability that we had in July during the G8 meeting held in L'Aquila. This is an important slide. It's, it's rather technical, but it's very important just because after 40 days we had asked to ourselves if our forecast had some sort of reliability compared to what we have observed. And these are the results of the test. The first test, the N test, sorry, let me, let me, okay. The N test is some sort of statistical test that say if the number of earthquakes that really occurred are compatible with the, our forecast, of, uh, with the number of earthquakes that, that we expect by our model. And here you reported the results um, in, the, in, uh, in space. I, I spent some word about that. Here, this means that this is in black is the number of observed earthquakes and uh, the light blue and red are, the forecast, are the, our forecasting. We have reported two forecasting simply because the first day we have made a terrible job. I mean, we, we underpredict clearly what, what's going on. After a, few, a couple of days, the things went well, like you see in the blue one. 
after uh, one week, some people, some colleagues of mine, say that the catalog uh, were revised. And using the revised catalog, we were able also to, uh, to make a very good forecast also for the first day. What happened? Happen, uh, what happened is, is very typical during an emergency. A lot of earthquakes that occurred immediately after the main shock were not reported immediate, immediately. Therefore, at the beginning, in our first forecast, we produced forecasts not using all the earthquakes that really occurred. Therefore, we underpredict the number of earthquakes. This is very important also for the people collecting data because they were mostly interested in communicating information to the civil protection. Now they know that also earthquakes that are not relevant immediately for civil protection, for instance, magnitude 4 that occurred a couple of hours after magnitude 6, is very important from a scientific point of view because in this way we can do a good job immediately, also the day after. Therefore, the basic point here is that we reproduce well the number of earthquakes of magnitude 2.5 that occurred uh, since uh, April 7. Here, this is a little bit more technical, but uh, the basic idea is that if we have the whole region and we divide this uh, region in, a, uh, in a some sub-region and we count how, what is the proportion of earthquakes occurring in some specific region, in, in uh, reality and what we have uh, forecasted. And we see that the forecast uh, work uh, pretty well. What does it mean? That the earthquake, not, we, were, we were not able only to forecast well the number of earthquakes, but also the position. This is the basic point. From this plot, what you can see is that earthquake occurred exactly where we expected by our model. Okay, that said, we say, okay, let me see how this kind of model could have worked the day after, the day after the main shock. This has been made retrospectively, not the, the day before, uh, not uh, in, in real time. The day before, we have run the same code just to see how this model would have forecasted the main shock. This is the, for, the forecast that we could have released the April 5 at 8 a.m., and this just a few hours before the main shock. What we have seen in the increasing probability in the, for, in the main shock area, the probability gain for the whole area is, here is 5, and here is 25. If we focus in the foreshock area, the increase in probability could be also two order of magnitude larger. But please, look at this number. The probability per day was very low in any case. What does it mean in practice? That this kind of model is able to detect strong increase in probability, but the probability remains very low using this sort of models. Therefore, last couple of slides just to show you what we have learned from our model and in general for, uh, for dealing with this, uh, using this kind of operational earthquake forecasting model. From the test of the first model, the forecast seemed well calibrated, describing correctly the space-time evolution of the aftershock sequence. In practice, we have some good skill to forecasting earthquake during an aftershock sequence. Therefore, we can do a good job in producing probability of the strongest aftershock. These are obviously very important in managing a, a crisis. Um, some people of you re remind what happened in Colfiorito. Colfiorito, just after the first big shock, a lot of technicians went in a church just to check the damages. The second main shock occurred, and some people were killed about that. This sort of model could help to avoid this sort of thing. Second point, ETS parameters. This is more, more scientific. The ETS parameters remain stable through time. We have established, uh, we have est estimated the parameters before the main shock, and we have applied that for um, a, a remain constant all in the whole sequence. This means that there are no other uh, parameters like fluid intrusion. We don't have the evidence of other parameters that influence the rate of uh, earthquake. The same model retrospectively detected an increase in probability before the main event, but the daily probability did not reach a value of 1%. Therefore, they remain at a very, very low value. Presently, decision makers are unable to use at best our skill. This is not a problem in Italy. I know that this is a problem all around the world. Decision makers want to hear yes or no. I'm sure or not. I'm, not sh I'm sure that it, it will not happen. What we can provide a probability usually very low probability, and they have to learn, they have to use at best these numbers. There is some work uh, about that that is going on. Another point is ETA's word is very simple. We have a tectonic background plus a very simple triggering rule. I, I don't believe that 
probably that's it. And therefore, we have to make some sort of additional work to see if we can Im increase the, this kind of uh, the forecast capability of this model. And last point, earthquake forecasting model covering short, mid, long term are usually different. And the one thing that is very, very important is to check the consistency among this model. This is uh, one of the points that is almost completely unexplored for, um, until now. Thank you for your attention. Have time for one brief question. No, yeah. Um, we, we just now, we are doing with some colleague here, with uh, Zhuang, we are, we are trying to see if what happened before, the forest shock activity is significantly different from what is expected by NITAS model. I cannot anticipate the results because <laughs> this is a work that we are doing now. For now, there is no clear evidence that the forest shock is different from what expected by classical NITAS model. What does it mean? A seismic swarm increases the probability to have a main shock. And always, this happened. But usually, this probability never reach a very high value. This is one of the problems, one of the limits that we have to face in forecasting main shock. This kind of model works definitely much, much better in the aftershocks sequence. Thanks very much. We're going to move on now to fault-based forecasting. This is a presentation by Pace, Peruzza, and Benisi. Good morning. In this talk, I show you the results of uh, earthquake forecasting time-dependent model developed in central Italy. And possible, I try to highlight what we have learned after the earthquake uh, in L'Aquila. In early 2000, we developed uh, a model of active fault for central Italy, published on 2004 on Journal of Seismology. And two years later, uh, using this active fault model, we develop a, a, a probabilistic time-dependent seismic hazard map in, uh, in central Italy. When, uh, in 2008, Italy was proposed as a testing region for uh, uh, collaboratories of study of earthquake predictability, we believe that our model was still reliable and proposed it to be tested in the frame of these CEP activities. The, end, uh, the deadline of the first CEP project was the end of March, and uh, we worked for two, to be in time with the deadline. And uh, as we know, on April 6th, an event struck L'Aquila. So, what I want to show you. Uh, firstly, I'll show you how the original model, published in 2006, was, uh, uh, was born. Then, what we, what we made to update the model until March 2009, and uh, finally, some questions, some discussions about what we are learned for future risk reduction. <clears throat> uh, the nature and distribution of uh, seismicity and active fault in central Italy suggests that uh, the deformation field is uh, mainly characterized by uh, extension in the central, uh, in the axial zone of the Apennines and by compression along uh, the, the Adriatic coast uh, to east. Using uh, seismicity integrated with geological uh, uh, field data, we are able to, uh, to, 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 um, uh, to delineate four seismotectonic provinces from west uh, to east, named with SPA, B, C, and D. The SPA is the Tuscan Latian provinces where uh, low rates of seismicity is expected. In the SPB, we have the main concentration of instrumental and historical seismicity with uh, magnitude that, re that reach values uh, uh, up to seven, like the 1915 Fushino earthquakes. Here we have uh, uh, a set of uh, uh, northwest uh, north deeping and southwest deeping uh, active uh, normal faults that are uh, marked with the red line. With uh, uh, the black line said we reported the seismogenic box that, uh, that are the uh, plane projection of the seismogenic uh, master faults. 
As I said, the model takes account three levels, three layers of information. The first one is the background seismicity. Background seismicity collects uh, mm, seismicity from uh, uh, magnitude 3 to 5.5, locally 4.5. We use a regularly spaced grid and a search radius of 20 kilometers within each circle. We computed uh, A and B coefficient of a truncated Gutenberg-Richter. We use uh, the Clustered Instrumental Catalog uh, published in 2001, the working group CSTI, that covered a range period from 1981 to 1996. Here I reported, uh, for example, the map of the B value obtained from this computation. The second layer is given is given by seismotectonic provinces, and the boundaries of these provinces are given by integration of seismicity uh, with, the major with major geological uh, structural elements. Within these seismotectonic provinces, we associate uh, high seismicity with magnitude uh, greater than 5.5, and except for the uh, seismotectonic province B, in the three SPA, SPC, and SPD, we use a corner type approach. That means uh, uh, uniform spatial distribution of, uh, of earthquake, uh, Gutenberg-Richter distribution in magnitude, and stationary processes in time. The third layers of information is given by individual sources boxes that are built up starting from the uh, from active fault uh, map. To each fault, so we associate a high, uh, high, an high level of seismicity with magnitude greater than 5.5. And using instrumental, historical, and paleoseismological data, to each one of these boxes, we associate a seismogenic uh, behavior. That uh, could be a characteristic earthquake, or a Gutenberg-Richter uh, behavior, or a hybrid given by a peak in the characteristic earthquake plus a Gutenberg-Richter tail. To each one of, the box, of these boxes, we also associate historical events to have a, a, a last event and the time elapsed from the last event. This is useful because we use a Brownian passage time distribution to calculate conditional probability uh, from, uh, from the last event. Here, what's, uh, what are the updated to accept 2009? Background seismicity and seismotectonic province will provide no changes except for background seismicity because we use a new grid to compute it AB value. For individual sources, we use the same geometries except two boxes located in the northern part of the area. Same occurrence model, same earthquake association. But using uh, uh, the data uh, information given by a recent paper of Peruzza et al. 2008, we used a new formal error propagation to compute a higher accuracy in probability computation. And we can see the results of this changing looking at the uh, variation in mean recurrence time and alpha values or coefficient of periodicity from BSSCI published in 2006 and the new with the orange bar computed in March 2009 for the XEP project. Here I reported also the values from three boxes located just close to the epicentral area of the L'Aquila events, that are the box number 11, 12, and 21. I also reported the expected magnitude and uh, the year of the last event associated to each box, and the T-mean computed. And as we can see, for the box number 12 and 21, the T-mean is very close to the elapsed set time from the last set to quick. So, uh, here I want to show you what was right and what was wrong with the last C2006 BSSR model. First, source identification. In the map, I plotted the, uh, the box with the uh, epicenter of the main shock given by the green star. And uh, as we can see, the source number 12 is uh, uh, right located with respect to this epicenter. Second, and uh, here we can show the, the same boxes given by the black lines. Uh, plotted on an interferometry uh, map. Second, also the size of the, of the event, we estimate a magnitude of 6.3 that will fit the magnitude of the event, as we can see in a recent works of uh, Walter Settali in 2009, where the magnitude was estimated of about 6.2, 6.3. Third, hazard priorities at the regional scale. We, uh, in 2006, we published that L'Aquila uh, was the most hazardous city in the study area, as we can see from uh, the map on the right, where the highest value of peak ground acceleration are located just south of the L'Aquila city. 
But now, what was wrong in this model? Certainly, we, uh, we said L'Aquila is the most hazardous other city, but this hazard was dominated not by the Paganica source, but the, by, by the Campo Felice of Indoli, uh, of Indoli source in the 2006 model. Anyway, going to, to see what we made for the last G2009 model, because we have no change in geometry and uh, magnitude of the, uh, of the boxes, the source identification, the size of the MMAX event is still correct. Moreover, the hazard estimate now is correct. In fact, using the new data computed at March 2009, we can see how the actual probability given in the range period of five years from 2009 to 2014, we can see how the boxes number 11, 12, and 21 located close to the epicentral area of these three boxes, the box 12, Paganica, is the one with the highest probability. So we can say we are correct to th that the hazard is dominated by the right source. Moreover, this data computed in March are available by a uh, website, and here you can see all data uh, to download this, uh, the seismicity rate behind the PGA map. But uh, still, what was right and what was wrong with the new uh, 2009 model. We said, I said that the source identification is correct, but the 2009 aftershock sequences suggest a different segmentation. So it's, uh, uh, of course, we need to review the segmentation pattern behind the PGA map. The size of the MMAX event is correct with respect to the, what we have seen in L'Aquila, but new trenches have found displacement of 40 centimeters, and so we need to discuss if it is due to after sleep or variability in sleep model, or we are underestimating the characteristic event. Third, the hazard estimate at the scale of individual source is correct, but our model cannot take in account other source processes like nucleation, directivity, and slip distribution. Moreover, stress transfer and or fluid pressure that we know may play a critical role in accelerating or decelerating the recharge of nearby sources is not taking account in our model. Clearly, we wish to collaborate with researchers involved in these topics to improve our model. So, going to conclude, our last C model is consistent with the 2009 earthquake. It's based on a, on a fault and a definition of a seismogenic source. It uses simplistic physical motivated model of earthquake recurrence and uses basic error propagation techniques. Uh, as I said, our is a time-dependent model, so after the 6th of April earthquake, uh, Paganica's probabilities drop to zero, but new data uh, as uh, paleoseismological uh, trenches give us new information for uh, a source located just to south of the Paganica ones that maybe increase the probability of this uh, source. But anyway, the aggregate probability of a characteristic event in the next five years on at least one of the mapped source is still high. Here I re reported uh, the computed uh, aggregated probability pre and post L'Aquila events computed using only nearest source and uh, medium distance source. And as we can see, the, the values are still high. So we claim effective strategies of seismic risk reduction that have to be promptly undertaken in central Italy. Thank you for your attention. We have time for some questions. I have one. I was wondering if there's a strategy in terms of uh, uncertainties about the segment boundaries. Uh, it seems like in this case it might have. No. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's difficult because we need to, to work a lot uh, with, uh, for example, the uh, slip distribution, uh, displacement distribution along the uh, strike of the fault. We made it. And uh, effectively, the Paganica alignment is one of the, uh, the worst studied. Uh, the inner alignment is, uh, is uh, the best one you know, uh, to, to, we have studied, and we hope to, 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 to begin to, do, to collect um, more data to segment these uh, these faults. Thanks much. Our uh, next presentation is on the fault system geometry and kinematics by Valoroso, and I think I would use up most of the allotted time if I read the author list, but uh, it's a large collection.
Okay. So, good morning, everybody. In this presentation, we are going to, to show you high resolution seismicity location of the foreshock and the aftershock sequences of the earthquake of the 2009 L'Aquila earthquake occurred in central Apennines. And um, this, the, the epicentral area is located in the central Apennines that is characterized by a northeast trending extension. And from north to south, we can see the, in map view the um, instrumental seismicity of the Colfiorito sequence occurred in 1997, the Norcia uh, sequence occurred in 1979, and in green, we, we report the aftershock sequence related to uh, the L'Aquila earthquake and the two major historical events closer to the epicentral area occurred in 1461 and in 1703. In this slide, we report the distribution in space and time of the seismicity. We have a map view in the upper, in the left, the part of the slide, and we projected all, uh, on uh, this northwest trending cross section all the seismicity. And the, this diagram is a space time diagram, and in which we can observe that. And we report a time window starting from January 1st of 2009 up to. Uh, last week, and we can observe uh, the occurrence of the forest shock sequence before the occurrence of the main shock on April 6, and we observe that most of the uh, all the magnitude, larger magnitude events occurred in a very narrow time window, and uh, we can also appreciate the lateral extent of the seismogenic volume activated, that is about 60 kilometers, and um, we can, in the following slide, we, if we zoom in on the, uh, on the on about three weeks of the seismicity, we can observe a clear migration toward the northwest, western sector of the, um, of the area. And in this, um, what we are, I'm going to show you are uh, the high resolution seismicity location in order to highlight the anatomy of the full system activated during the Lagula sequence using two different type, using a forest shock data set and an aftershock data set. Forest shock are 400 events with magnitude less than 4.1 that we recorded and triggered on continuously recording waveforms using 20 regional station and that means that we have a, a, with the interstation distance of about 30 40 kilometers while the aftershock sequence that cover a time spanning from the April 6th up to the end of June is uh, represented using 2,200 events with magnitude in the 1.9, 6.3 range that we recorded at a very dense local network installed soon after the occurrence of the, uh, the, the main shock, uh, with characterized by an inter interstation distance of 6, 8 kilometers. We, um, uh, uh, measured P and S wave arrival times on this waveform using a newly developed automatic picking system procedure and detail on this procedure will be given tomorrow afternoon at this poster session and uh, we um, we obtained 1D location using an optimized 1D P wave velocity model for the area and um, um, we also uh, we also took into account the difference, we, we use a different uh, weighting function with the distance in order to take into account the variation of the geometry of the network during the time. And uh, at the end, we will show you double difference article relocation using uh, picket data and uh, waveform cross-correlation data. 
So uh, this is the map, the geometry of the map that we use, uh, and uh, this is the, the P-wave velocity model used for the 1D location, and these are the two different values of the UPS ratio used for the forest shock and the aftershock sequence. Uh, and uh, in this slide, I just wanted to uh, highlight the improvement in the earthquake location that we obtained moving from 1D to double difference location. And at the end, we ended up with a formal relative location error of about hundreds of meters for the forest shock sequence and um, tens of meters for the aftershock. So this is the uh, map view of the forest shock in red and the aftershock in black of the uh, data set as have been located in, in our study. And uh, as we can see, the, um, the, the, the aftershock occur on two main fault planes, a southern fault plane and a northern fault plane. And in this map, we show also the focal mechanisms are computed by Herman and Malianini. And um, for the largest magnitude um, events, and we plot events with magnitude greater than four. And what we can observe that all the focal mechanisms show a normal fault in kinematics, uh, and uh, some of them, just two of them located to the south of the fault system activated, shows a, a, a strike slip left a lateral component. And what is interesting is that these two, but I cannot accurately show it on the map. It, is this, okay, is this, this one and this the one are the deepest earthquake recorded during the aftershock sequence. Okay, sorry. Okay, let's have a closer look at the foreshock sequence. Uh, events that occurred in the time window starting from uh, the 1st of January up to the occurrence of these large events, the, the largest foreshock with magnitude 4.1 occurred the, on March 30, 2009, are uh, in, in the map view are aligned along a northwest trending plane that is the same that will be activated by the main shock of April. Six. And while what we can observe is that starting from the occurrence of this large forest shock, we observe a migration of the seismicity, of the following seismicity, along a different fault plane. And uh, in the cross section one, that is a transversal cross section, northwest trending, we can appreciate the depth distribution of this, uh, the seismicity or that in, in map view is aligned along this north south structure. So we believe that the, af the, the main aftershock with magnitude 4.1 is probably activated this antithetic structure or at least the this off fault seismicity, while the following other main force shock with magnitude 3.9 that occurred just five hours before the main shock is, shows the same focal mechanism, normal focal mechanism along the same fault plane that will be activated by the main shock. And in this, we added to this cross section the projection of the aftershock related to the main events in order to appreciate the geometrical relationship between the shock sequence and the aftershock sequence. So this is again a plot of the aftershock sequencing map and we also and along with the uh, uh, focal mechanisms for the large magnitude events and we also report in this map view the location, the trace of the major quaternary normal faults that are northwest trending uh, oriented. And the green line is the um, rupture uh, observed along the Sandometro Paganica Fault, the surface rupture observed in the field just after the occurrence of the main shock and along the Sandometro Paganica Fault. We will describe the seismicity distribution, the aftershock distribution with depth, uh, dividing all the volume uh, with, uh, in using vertical 
vertical section spaced one kilometer apart and projecting earthquakes plus minus 500 meters from the vertical section. We will describe three different areas, the Southern Fault, the Lacula Fault, and the Campos Fault. We will start looking at the, um, the most interesting, of course, uh, Lacula Fault and what we can observe in all these cross sections that are uh, organized from south to north, uh, we can see that all the seismicity is uh, located, occurred in the first 10 to 12 kilometers of the upper crust, between zero and 10 kilometers in the upper crust. We also uh, can very clearly appreciate the 50 degree degrees deep deeping plane toward the southwest activated by the main shock that is located at the bottom of this activated plane. And uh, we can follow we can yeah we can follow this structure in all the section that we plotted in this panel and um, we can also uh, appreciate the presence of minor parallel fault segments in the foothold of the main structure and uh, as well as also minor antithetic structure always in the foothold of the main plane. Um, so um, let's in, okay, in this, uh, we projected in all, this in all the, the vertical section, the seismicity has appeared in section 18 uh, in order to appreciate the lateral extent of the activated full plane. And so we end up with, uh, we believe that the seismicity image of this, the seismological image of this fault is about, in the highlight a plane about 60 kilometers long. And uh, moving to the southern termination of the fault system, we can see that uh, we, uh, we start, see, we, we, we always see some um, alignment along southwest dipping planes, but characterized by a lower deep angle. And what is interesting that is starting from the south and going up to the north, we see that in this cross section, the seismicity is not more organized along a full plane, but is more cloudily uh, organized. And uh, what is interesting and is important in these two last cross section is the projection of the deepest event of this uh, sequence that is a large event with magnitude 5.4 that occurred the day after the occurrence of the main shock and, uh, and this is the focal mechanism related and these are the few aftershocks related to this main event. So we believe that this, uh, this main event um, is located and wrapped ruptured a nine angle full plane dipping probably toward east or northeast. And so finally, let's have a look at the northern portion of the, the activated full system. Oh. And what is interesting to note in this panel is that seismicity occur in, in the 10, 5 kilometer depth, while the first 5 kilometer of the upper crust doesn't show the activation doesn't show seismicity and in this cross section we we what we want to highlight and to um, stress is the presence of this changing of in the deep geometry of the full system and also that every time we see a, a changing in the deep we can this is always related to the occurrence at the bottom of, of a main shock and that's it and this is the last slide in which we, would we wanted to uh, show the correlation of the seismicity distribution with the rupture model as obtained by joint inversion of strong motion and GPS data by Chiarella et al. And uh, this is a section along deep and we projected on this plane plus minus 500 meter of the seismicity. And what we can observe is that there is a, a complete anti-correlation between the, um, the, the seismicity distribution and the patches that experiences the highest sleep. 
okay. And so this is again a cross, a, 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 a section along the Apennines reporting all the historical and instrumental seismicity. And we can see that the seismicity um, of the L'Aquila sequence is correlated with the occurrence of the 1461 event and uh, the 1703 events. And what we can appreciate is that there is a gap of seismicity here and, it, and also that the northern portion of the faults was, did not rupture all the upper crust. So this is probably an interesting point to discuss for future large earthquakes. And that's it. These are some conclusions for this study. Thanks. I think we've uh, used up all the time, so we're going to move on to the next uh, speaker. I'm going to talk about the preparatory phase of the uh, L'Aquila earthquake, and the presentation will be given by Lucente. Good morning. I will describe the preparatory phase of the L'Aquila earthquake through the analysis of uh, its uh, first shock sequence. Uh, the main shock was uh, preceded by a sequence uh, with, uh, which uh, lasts about six months and intensified three months before the main shock. Uh, the dense configuration of the seismic network operating in the epicenter area gave us, uh, for the first time, the opportunity for a, a um, description of the preparatory phase of the earthquake uh, in detail. Uh, starting from January, the National Seismic Network recorded about 300 events in the epicenter area, most of which were densely clustered around the uh, Mineshock hypocenter. Uh, this cluster includes six events with magnitude greater than three, and one magnitude four for a shock, which, as we'll see, is very important in our reconstruction. This uh, uh, largest magnitude four shock occurred on the 13th of March. Um, we focus our analysis on 188 four shock occurred before January which are well located, and, and uh, on this four shock, we uh, measure two seismological quantities, uh, which are uh, the ratio between uh, uh, compressional and shear wave velocity and uh, shear wave splitting. But these quantities are highly informative on the uh, mm, elastic properties of the rock traveled by uh, seismic waves and on their variation, therefore on how the stress leading to the major fault failure builds up in your case. Uh, for each uh, of the four shock, we uh, compute the uh, VPVS ratio at uh, the 11 station shown in this map. Uh, on this slide, uh, we show four uh, time series of uh, single event VPVS measurement uh, for uh, the average value of all the stations shown in the map, which is the, the top plot, and uh, for three single stations, which are roughly aligned along the, uh, the direction perpendicular to this uh, strike of the main fault, uh, and therefore uh, are chosen as uh, the most representative to show uh, variation of the elastic properties in the fault zone. As we will see, the outstanding feature in all the four time series is a, a sharp change of the VPVS value on 13th of March, which is the time of occurrence of the largest magnitude in the first shock sequence. Uh, on average, in the epicentral area, on the top plot, the uh, value of BPVS raises uh, from 1.85 to 1.92. Uh, and then decreases again one, to 1.85 in the seven uh, following day before the main shock. A similar behavior is observed at that station Aku and Fiam, which are both located on the hanging wall of the fault. While uh, the station GSO2, which is located on the foot wall side of the fault, to show an opposite trend. 
the VPVS values are very high already during, during the period from January to March. Then, on the uh, 13th of March, uh, the uh, VPVS value drops down to 1.86, which is the mean value in the area of VPVS. So, this, uh, this observation suggests that uh, seismic waves travel uh, uh, across a fractured uh, media and the uh, fracture field properties varies with time. Therefore, um, the characteristic of a fractured media can, um, fracture field can also be studied by seismic anisotropy. Therefore, we compute the shear wave splitting parameter at the station NACU, which is the, the closest station to the Photoshop cluster, and the only one site for which all the shear waves are within the shear waves windows, allowing for a complete time series of measurement. We compare the uh, time series for uh, uh, shear wave splitting parameters at ACU with the value of VPVS at the same station, which is uh, again the, the top plot. We observe that the normalized delay time between fast and split wave and uh, a slow split wave is low until the middle of March. Then it starts to increase in the second half of March uh, until the 13th of March. On this date, the, uh, the value uh, drops uh, and then undergoes to a further uh, uh, fluctuation in the seven day in, uh, before the main shock. The azimuth of the fast split wave is uh, um, oriented in northwest southeast direction, it's quite stable and uh, um, this uh, orientation is parallel to the strike of the activated fault system and to the uh, maximum horizontal stress acting in the area. Then on 13th of March, uh, this value becomes unstable and starts to fluctuate. Uh, the uh, um, uh, shear wave which show no splitting are uh, linearly polarized, uh, uh, consistent with theory at 90 degrees from the prevalent uh, azimuth uh, fast uh, split wave. Then, uh, on 13th of March, uh, this linear polarization uh, undergo a sharp change. Uh, all the this observation, uh, both temporal variation of VPVS and shear wave splitting parameters, concur in identifying the occurrence of the largest magnitude force shock on uh, 13th of March as a defining moment uh, in the preparatory phase uh, of these earthquakes. Uh, until 13th of March, we observe the low value of VPVS at station on the hanging wall of the fault and the in increasing delay time of splitting shear waves at station NACU. At the same time, uh, we observe high VPVS value at station on the foot wall of the fault. On 13th of March, we observe a sharp increase of VPVS observed at the station uh, on the hanging wall of the fault while the VPVS uh, drops at GSO2 on the foot wall. Uh, at, uh, after the 13th of March, fast direction of uh, um, shear split wave becomes unstable, uh, suggesting 90 degree flip polarization phenomena, and the uh, uh, delay time suddenly decreases. We reconcile uh, this observation in uh, one hypothesis, uh, a physical model which can explain our observation. Uh, until 13th of March, the rocks in the hanging wall of the fault undergo a progressive opening of cracks and fractures in a classical dilatancy scheme. At the same time, rocks in the foot wall side are fluid filled and fluids are confined within the fold, foot wall by a sealed fault with sealing created by repeated episodes of slip along the same fault structure. The magnitude 4 forest shock break the seal between foot wall and hanging wall, a fluid burst across the fault zone, filling fractures and crack opened in the hanging wall. The transient represented by fluid flowing across the fault zone induces change 
in the state of stress and fluid spore pressure, recorded by variation of seismic of anisotropy parameters we observe. Also, variation of fluid pressure condition for fluid diffusion, diffusion in a larger volume of the gas in a surface caused the large scatter and the fluctuation of both the anisotropic parameters in the subsequent days. We approximate the space and time variant condition in the L'Aquila earthquake fault zone by a two phases synthetic model. In the phase one, uh, which is until 30 of, of March, um, we reduce the VP in the hanging wall by a 10% to represent the lavance and the VS in the foot wall by a 10% to simulate the presence of fluid filled, filled reservoir. In the second phase, we restore the VP value in the hanging wall to the normal value and the VS is lowered by 5% to model the diffusion of fluids from the foot wall to the hanging wall. That's way low velocity anomaly in the foot wall vanishes to simulate the emptying of the fluid reservoir. Of course, our purpose is to obtain a qualitative feedback on our hypothesis. Therefore, the uh, value we, of anomaly we introduce uh, in this model a coarse value, as we mm, cannot make any inference on the amount of fracturation and uh, of fluids present in the rock volume. We then compute synthetic travel time with this model and reconstruct synthetic VPVS time series. We compare synthetic data with observed data and despite the fact that it's a purely qualitative model, in our opinion it satisfactorily reproduces the VPVS observation. This tells us that uh, the proposed one is a reliable model. Our concluding remarks are that variation of seismological quantities during the preparatory phase of the L'Aquila earthquake demonstrates that a complex sequence of the latency and fluid diffusion processes affect the rock volume surrounding the nucleation area. These processes reach paroxysmal manifestation about a week before the mine shock occurrence. We, a posteriori, recognize this manifestation as measurable precursory effects. And a relatively simple, purely qualitative model satisfactorily explains the physical process that produce what we observe. Finally, whether the Observed variation can be considered a characteristic of other damaging earthquakes is a no. There are evidence for a major role played by fluids of seismogenesis in the only past comparable case in Italy. And the overpressurization fault structures have been suggested as a primary trigger of normal faulting earthquakes. Therefore, we are convinced that similar processes have a chance to be observed in the preparatory phase of future earthquakes, both in Italy and elsewhere. Thank you. Do we have any questions? I have one. If, if this was to be used as a... a forecasting tool, it would be nice to have a baseline estimate of what normal variations are. Yeah. Do you have any plans yeah. to conduct that experiment? One of the next step we, step we are thinking to, to we are planning is to um, reconstruct a case history through the analysis of the uh, seismic catalog to, to see whether the variation can be a representative of uh, this kind of phenomena. We have to, to fix the, the boundary. All right, we're going to move on now to the next presentation, which will identify the source of these high pressure fluids the, by Terakawa et al. And Terakawa will be giving the uh, presentation. Good morning. Uh, today, 
We will show that the, this year's lucky earthquake sequence is being driven by high pressure fluid. Recently, we developed a new analysis technique termed focal mechanism tomography by examining focal mechanism data of seismic events. We apply the method to focal mechanism for the 2009 Lakira earthquake sequence and directly estimate three-dimensional fluid pressure distribution in the Lakira region. Considering the fluid pressure distribution, locations of first shocks and aftershocks, and evolution of seismicity, we will, uh, we will propose a scenario for the Lakira earthquake sequence. This, uh, the two figures show seismicity and CO2 emission in Italy. In the western Mediterranean region of Italy, we can observe massive CO2 emission associated with subduction. Comparing the CO2 emission with seismicity, we can see that large earthquakes have occurred along the boundary that separate regions with diffuse and non-diffuse CO2 degassing. This year is Lakira, and 1997 Colfiorito earthquake sequences occurred on the boundary. The Colfiorito earthquake sequence was shown to be driven by high pressure fluid. So we guess that a similar uh, fluid source may exist in Lakira region. The basic idea for, for focal mechanism tomography are that seismic slip occurred in the direction of the resolved shear traction on pre-existing faults, which is the same assumption as in the stress inversion of fault slip data, and that the fault slip is controlled by Coulomb fracture criterion with the standard friction coefficient. If the fluid pressure is hydrostatic, we expect that seismic slip occur on the optimally oriented fault to the regional stress pattern. However, the increase of the fluid pressure decreases the fault strength. This corresponds to the line for the fault strength shift to the right in the mole diagram. So we can expect seismic slip on misoriented faults depending on the fluid pressure. In the present method, um, we apply, uh, first we apply the stress inversion to 148 focal mechanisms uh, for the lucky earthquake obtained by St. Louis University and determine the stress pattern in the model region shown in the map. In this step, we discriminate true-fold planes from auxiliary planes. In this case, the maximum principal stress is vertical. So, assuming that the fault seismic slip on the optimally oriented faults occurred on, under the hydrostatic fluid pressure, we can determine the minimum and intermediate principal stresses to be 0 0.6 sigma 1 and 0 0.8 sigma 1, respectively. Then, examining the ori orientation of the fault plane to the regional stress pattern and stress state acting on the fault plane, we can determine the fluid pressure based on the Coulomb fracture criterion. Most events in the data set can be well explained by the activation of pre-existing fault and as a simple stress pattern. This figure shows the data consistency with the stress pattern. We measure data consistency by using closeness of theoretical and observed moment tensors defined by Michael 1987. The CT values take from minus one to one. The larger CT means that two tensors are more similar to each other. 
72% of the data set have CD values greater than 0.975. This corresponded to the average difference angle between theoretical and observed slip vectors of only 5.6 degrees. This figure shows the distribution of ex excess fluid pressure above hydrostatic fluid pressure in the normalized mole diagram. The color and the size of the circles show fluid pressure and magnitude of events. The gray line shows the fault strength and the hydrostatic intermediate and lithostatic fluid pressure. First of all, a vast majority of events occurred under hydrofracture condition, which is uh, consistent with the observed double couple focal mechanisms. We can see that the main shock occurred at, at near hydrostatic fluid pressure, while um, many aftershocks occurred at significantly elevated fluid pressure. Many small events occurred on the optimally oriented faults at near hydrostatic pressure. In order to estimate three-dimensional excess fluid pressure field, we apply an inversion technique developed by Yabuki and Matsura, 1992, which is based on the Bayesian statistical inference, to 106 fluid pressures uh, in the model region obtained through focal mechanism tomography. In the method, we can obtain the fluid pressure field by a continuous function defined in a three-dimensional three space. The figure on the right-hand side shows the obtained three-dimensional fluid pressure distribution. We can observe high-pressure fluid reservoir uh, at depths between 7.5 km to 10 km. The hypocenter of the main shock is located in the highest fluid pressure reservoir. This figure shows the map views of excess fluid pressure field. We superpose 467 uh, seismic events with magnitude equal to or greater than 2.5, which occurred within one kilometer of each plane. Most of seismic events shown here don't have focal mechanisms, so they are independent of estimation of fluid, fluid pressure field. However, uh, we can clearly see the strong correlation between calculated fluid pressure field and independent uh, seismic events. This is uh, compelling evidence that the, this year's Lakila earthquake sequence is being driven by high pressure fluid. This is the full image of three-dimensional fluid pressure field. Seismic events appear as hollows around the high pressure fluid reservoir. This figure shows the fluid pressure distribution on the cross section at the hypocenter of the main shock with, uh, with evolution of seismicity. In the upper figure, we can see that poor shocks concentrated in the highest pressure fluid reservoir. The middle figure shows that uh, early aftershocks occurred at and around the fluid pressure reservoir in the hanging wall of the main shock fault. As shown in the bottom figure, uh, subsequent uh, aftershocks within one week of the main shock migrated upward along the main shock fault and within the foot wall. On the other hand, the top figure on the right-hand side shows the dilatation due to the main shock. 
from this figure and this figure, early aftershocks seem to be related with volumetric compression due to the main shock. The migration of seismicity upward along the main shock fault is consist consistent with the theoretical expectation from fluid pressure diffusion model as shown in the bottom figure in the left-hand side. Our result lead to the following scenario for the Lakira earthquake sequence. In the Lakira region, there are overpressurized CO2 reservoirs associated with subduction. Because CO2 is supplied from below but cannot escape there. Four shocks occurred in the highest pressure fluid reservoir, which promoted invasion of fluid pressure near the hypocenter of the main shock. The increase of fluid pressure at the base of the main shock fault weakened the strength of the main shock fault and initiated faulting on the norm optimally oriented fault to the regional stress pattern. The main shock of normal faulting volumetrically compressed the fluid pressure, initiating fluid flow and fluid diffusion. We would conclude that one of the dominant mechanisms driving the lacular earthquake sequence is the decrease of uh, shear strength of the pre-existing fault due to the increase of the fluid pressure. And to summarize, we applied, uh, we estimated and mapped the three-dimensional fluid pressure field in the Lakira region by applying new analysis technique, focal mechanism tomography, to actual uh, seismic data. The very co strong correlation between high pressure regions and aftershock locations is the evidence that the Lakila earthquake sequence is being driven by post seismic fluid flow. Thank you very much. A question here? So now we'll be uh, looking at surface faulting, and the presentation will be given by Chinti. Good morning to everybody. I'm going to present you some preliminary results on the paloseismological investigation conducted in the area of the 2009 earthquake sequence. Uh, before I show you data, I would like to tell you why we started this trenching campaign, which is still ongoing. Uh, the magnitude 6.3 main shock on April 6 produced deformation at surface, and the most significant ruptures occurred uh, for, uh, uh, with a clear expression for a continuous extent of, of about 3 kilometers along the southwest tip in Paganica Normal Fault, east of L'Aquila. Uh, uh, most of geologists agree in saying that the Paganica ruptures represent the surface rupture of the fault responsible for the main shock. Uh, I will make just a brief list of the main characteristics of the surface trace, but I invite you to see the poster by Merjau Working Group tomorrow afternoon uh, for a wider description of the earthquake features at surface, and there's also a slideshow with additional information on the event. 
Uh, anyway, uh, rupture had persistent orientation. Um, uh, the alignment shows a spatial continuity, and the surface trace occurs uh, independently from slope angle, type of deposit cross, or type, type of main made features, and they always coincide with the long term geomorphic expression of the Paganica fault. A uh, few slides, few photos just to show you how the rupture appeared on the ground. Uh, they were um, mostly open cracks uh, with an average opening of 10 centimeters, vertical displacement or warping uh, uh, maximum 15 centimeters, always southwest side down, and they were commonly organized in an echelon arrangement. They crossed loosened cemented deposits, but also paved courtyards and roads, walls, and buildings. So finally, to answer why, to our question, why we started this trenching campaign, we know that the area is a network-prone area that was repeatedly struck by large magnitude events uh, in historical age. And they likely left geological evidence uh, uh, on the ground, just like the April 2009 did. So we looking for the geological, the geological expression of these paleoethics, we wish to contribute to the discussion on several issues. Uh, such as when the Paganica fault activated in the past, uh, how large were the past earthquakes and the expected maximum magnitude of the area, uh, where and uh, which is the size of the expected displacement at surface uh, with implication on surface faulting hazard, and average frequency of slip. So let's start. Uh, this is an Iconos image uh, zoomed um, in the area of the Paganica rupture trace. And uh, just notice uh, how the, the villages of uh, Paganica and Tempera are exactly developed in the hanging wall of the, of the fault. Uh, in, white is the, um, uh, the, in white is the area of the ancient village, which was um, strongly damaged, uh, damaged in, um, in 2009, but also with the events in the 18th century. Uh, arrows indicate point the location of the trenching site we are going to see. Uh, three are across the 2009 rupture trace and one is uh, um, across the long-term evidence. So let's start from north to south with the first, uh, which is the aqueduct site. This is a special site. It was not excavated by a backhoe, but was excavated by the overpressure water ejected from the broken pipeline uh, of the main aqueduct, which collapsed being on the fault trace. And the arrows indicate that, um, the portion of the pipeline uh, which was exposed. I have a video. It's a low-resolution video, but still gives the idea of what happened that morning. Uh, the water was going upslope from the broken junction of the pipe. We are talking about, about 60, 70 atmosphere. And, and um, lots of water was flowing down. And material, uh, mud and other pebbles and materials was uh, filling at least the ground floor of the buildings down below. And this is the result of the big trouble. Um, the field was trenched about 80 meters, and uh, at the back, uh, the white arrows indicate the Paganica fault scar, and in red, instead, are the surface trace we observed uh, on top of the fault scar uh, collapse road. And so after the restoration of the pipeline, we went a little bit deeper uh, as much as we could. But anyway, the, the, the trench wall exposed, exposed a complex system of normal faults exactly below the Paganica scarp that repeatedly sheared and faulted southwest side down alluvial pedogenic and colluvial deposits from middle late Pleistocene to Holocene age. We identified uh, at least five main shear planes. And um, we are going to see in details the most interesting zone, which is um, in correspondence of uh, the 2009 rupture, yeah, which is the green uh, rectangle. In general, we may say that below the upper part of the scar particularly, we saw interformation of faults in the alluvial fan deposits, which were quite clear because of the rotation of class in the shear zone, abrupt displacement, and um, of a really well-defined layers. And, and also we found antithetic faults forming rubbing of about four, meter, uh, five, four to five meter wide. But anyway, the foot of the scarp is the most active fault zone at this site in the sense that we found the most recent repeated movements observed along the same fault in coincidence of the 2009 rupture, which was running on top of, um, of, uh, of this field, and this is a shot of how they looked. 
So zooming where the youngest displaced deposits exposed in the excavation are, here we found the uh, evidence for uh, um, in, uh, the individual uh, slip of uh, a pre-2009 event, uh, which can be set on top of the unit here marked as 61. Uh, this because this unit is, uh, records a larger amount of offset relative to the overlying unit, which are just a warp of about 10 centimeters, possibly associated to the deformation of the 2009 uh, event. So uh, in terms of dating, we may say, I mean, it's, uh, everything is quite preliminary for now, but we may say that the event uh, post-date uh, the age of the pottery fragments we found uh, within the fold zone inside this unit which is uh, broadly constrained back to the 2000 year BP or possibly it was common also in 12th, 13th century. So just moving 20 meter um, south, we arrived to the exact site. Uh, this is, uh, we are quite in correspondence of the um, projection of the fault trace we just saw. And what we did is just to move back the embankment to reach the surface trace which are on top. So here we found that the 2009 rupture coincides with the fall plane at depth, which is very sharp, and, and, and the repeated cosmic movement along this plane placed in contact different uh, kind of deposits of different age. So rupture propagate upward along a main plane, which is 50 to 55 degrees dipping, and when close uh, uh, to the ground level, uh, vertically diverge and breaks the surface. So this is a detail of uh, the upper part of the, of the rupture. And what we can say that is that the V-shape that the um, 2009 rupture does with the main fold plane, it seems something that uh, a recurrent geometry also in the past, uh, in past uh, events. In fact, this um, dark unit marked here with the star is, um, is lowered by multiple uh, vertical strands and every time is dragged into the main fold plane. So similar geometry is also on the other wall. And also at this site we found uh, the evidence for a suggestion for, for a pre-2009 event, uh, which can be set on, uh, at the base of the slope deposit, so you're marked in yellow line. And um, for now we may say that uh, it occurred in historical age, and it's about 28 centimeter of vertical slip. One kilometer and a half south, we arrived to the Motretica site. It's a private land where the rupture were, um, ruptures were quite um, well expressed. And uh, there is no doubt that also here we found uh, the, um, that below the, the rupture is, um, is a fall plane where repeated uh, events occurred. And among the sites here, we found the thickest sequence of late Holocene deposits, which is very interesting for us to reconstruct the history, the recent history of the fault. And um, the, the, the stratigraphy is clearly displaced across the faults and drops down to our south. And what we found is an increasing of slip with depth. And actually at the base, the gravelly white unit is, uh, is interrupted and we found it at about um, recording a larger cumulative uh, displacement of about 4.38 meter, which is the depth where we found it with, uh, with, the bore, uh, with the borehole in the hanging wall. So finally, these great amounts of offset, upward fall terminations, flexor layers, uh, suggest the evidence for a total of five events, uh, including 2009. And uh, the dating available from pottery fragments and C14 uh, provides information on the timing of, of activity. And in summary, we may say that um, uh, event two, pre-2009, uh, is about 10 centimeter vertical slip occurred after 640 AD. And, and we also um, think that it's compatible with the 1461 event, which is the historical event considered a twin um, of, uh, of the 2009, uh, both for location and size. Three individual events um, with a variable slip between 1025 and occurred after between 790 BC and 770 AD. So, and this is the last site, uh, which is a 250K site, doesn't have anything to do with dating, but it's just the price of the apartments uh, that were selling uh, uh, before the event. And what we did is to use the embankment on, uh, in a building site. No ruptures uh, were observed here. 
Well, the, the fault is supposed to fold zone and the graben facing uh, fold zone A and there's a detail at the corner, uh, the fold at the corner. And among the study site, here we found the oldest event of faulting. So both fold zones exhibit uh, um, the evidence for uh, um, a most recent event, uh, which can be set where the youngest, faulted, uh, where the youngest uh, deposits are. Uh, faulted and uh, dating tell us that uh, the, the event on both faults could be the same, uh, so coeval. And then we have, uh, based on the increasing of, increasing of displacement of the, with depth and also based on the presence of, the, of a, colluvial, a faulted colluvial wedge, we set the penultimate event. And in summary, so event one has a vertical slip of 50 centimeter, adding the offset produced along both folds, and occurred after 800 BC. And event two, uh, 17 centimeter, even in this case, adding the offset produced along both folds, occurring after 5000 BC. But we are not sure if they are the same in the two fold zones yet. So we arrive to the preliminary results, the work is in progress, but um, we may say something on the style of deformation. The Paganica eruptor uh, uh, is directly related to fault plane adapt, where we observe multiple events of faults in, uh, that occur in the past with similar style of deformation. So structure and microstructure are um, well-defined or recurrent geometries. Uh, then we may say something on the slipper event. Uh, if we look at the plot of the observed slipper event at different sides uh, um, uh, uh, with time, we may say uh, that the, the penultimate, the most recent event in the last 2,500 year uh, show com are comparable with the 2009 in terms of amount of slip. But at the same time, we have indication for events of faulting prior this interval with larger amount of slip. So. Is this enough to affirm that, that during the past two millennia, the Pecanica fault did not uh, produce uh, uh, man, uh, events uh, with much larger than 2009? We believe that uh, absolutely we require additional validation, particularly if we consider the, the complexity of the fault at surface. Then we may say something on the slip rate or recurrence activity uh, only for the Motretica trenches where we have the sequence of events and datings. And the, the min, a minimum slip rate for the last 2,500 years of uh, 0.3 millimeter per year is estimated, which is a typical value for the faults in central Apennines. And then uh, uh, having five events of faulting at surface, including 2009, uh, in the last 2,500 uh, years, we may estimate a rough average recurrence of about 625 uh, year. But also this one is estimated based on this it's based on just one site, so we need uh, um, other additional uh, sites. Thank you. Time for one quick question. Thank you. So our last presentation for today will be given by Amoruso on the uh, slow earthquake following the L'Aquila event. Also, before everybody gets away, one last reminder, tomorrow a massive poster session in the afternoon. to everybody, uh, the Grand Sasso extensometers have produced a very clear uh, records of the formation before and after L'Aquila earthquake. In particular, in particular uh, here I'm showing you uh, data regarding uh, early post-seismic deformation, I mean uh, the first four days after the earthquake. Uh, Pre-seismic deformation is uh, the subject uh, of a poster tomorrow, uh, while we are still working on uh, post-seismic deformation after April the 11th. Unfortunately, co-seismic deformation data are, are reliable because of filters in the electronics. Okay, as regards the first four days after the event, 
uh, I'll try to convince you that strain after about one day is fully consistent with after sleep on a stationary region of the earthquake causative fault, while the preceding few hour long transient is consistent with unilateral diffusive sleep propagation toward the shallower part of the same fault where uh, superficial fractures have been observed. And that the same diffusive propagation path ends just where later after sleep probably occurred. Okay, at first, a couple of words about uh, the extensometers. They measure extension changes uh, for two 90 meter long baselines called BC and BA. BC is uh, approximately uh, perpendicular to the local uh, direction of the Apennines, while BA is uh, approximately parallel to it. Uh, the nominal resolution is better than one peak of strain, uh, with a uh, nominal bandwidth ranging from 100 overts uh, to uh, the continuum. The extensometers are located at a depth of about 1,400 meters, close to the underground LNG. GS laboratories, which uh, are mainly devoted to uh, astroparticle physics. Okay, with respect to the uh, earthquake fault, the extensometers are more or less 20 uh, kilometers northeast of the main shock epicenter. BC is approximately perpendicular to the fault strike, while BA is approximately parallel to it. And here you can see data recorded during the, four, uh, the first four days uh, after the earthquake. You see that BC uh, shortens uh, monotonically with the time, while uh, B, BA's uh, strain history is more complicated. But looking better at what happens after the first day, you can see that uh, BC strain is about twice as, twice as large as a BA strain, but opposite in sign. Uh, we uh, computed uh, um, post seismic deformation in a poroelastic and viscoelastic layered earth, but we found that uh, poroelasticity and viscoelasticity are unable. Uh, to produce this kind of uh, uh, trend, this kind of history. Uh, so uh, a possible explanation involves after sleep in a stationary region of the fault plane able to give a BC strain about twice as large as BA strain but opposite in sign. But of course uh, this kind of process can't justify the first hours of a strain record, of strain history, here enlarged in the blue insets. Once again, computations show that poroelasticity and viscoelasticity are unable to predict this kind of behavior. And a possible explanation involves a slow slip propagation on the fault plane, but this works only if the fault plane is divided by another line uh, as regards the formation recorded by BA. Okay, these plots show that uh, this is really the case. Uh, this is the nodal line, this is, uh, sorry, uh, contour lines show strain generated at uh, the interferometer site, at the extensometer site, by small rectangular sources located in different parts of the fault. And this is the nodal line I mentioned. But uh, we can get further information looking at some combination of BC strain and BA strain uh, to obtain shear strain and area strain. Uh, we see that not only BC strain decreases monotonically with the time, but also shear strain and area strain. So uh, looking at this region, uh, this blue region uh, on the fault plane, 
we see that it is divided by a nodal line as regards the formation at BA, but it, gives, uh, it always gives a negative BC strain, negative uh, uh, shear strain, and negative either strain. So it's a good candidate uh, for the slow uh, slip uh, propagation. In the meantime, if you look at this yellow area, you see that uh, it produces BC strain, which is about twice as large as BA strain, but opposite in sign. So, and it's uh, the only part of the fault able to produce this kind of signal, and it's a, a very good candidate for uh, the after-sleep part. We tested two mechanisms for the slow slip propagation. The first mechanism is a constant rupture velocity model like in usual earthquakes. The second mechanism is a diffusive process uh, that is displacement, sorry, displacement proportional to the square root of time. Uh, the same process we suggested in 1999 for uh, slow earthquakes uh, observed in the Grand Sasso area. So here are data again, and uh, you can see that uh, the constant rupture velocity model gives a poor fit to data. On the contrary, the diffusive propagation model here in green uh, gives a very, very good fit to date. Uh, and, uh, okay, here again, uh, the causative fault of the earthquake. And these uh, cyan arrows uh, exemplify the class of minimum misfit uh, slip propagation paths over the fault. You see that there is some uncertainty on the along a deep uh, position of the starting point of the paths, but they always end at uh, the same point of the fault, very close to observed uh, superficial fracture, and uh, to the only part of the fault uh, able uh, to give after slip signal as that observed, that is uh, the um, probable source of after slip. Coming in, okay, entering into more details about the diffusive process, uh, uh, you can see that uh, the release, the seismic moment, uh, decreases uh, about linearly uh, with the distance along the path. And uh, this shape is like a temperature in uh, um, the steady state solution, steady state profile in, in case of heat diffusion. So this result uh, strengthens, supports um, uh, the existence of a diffusion process. Uh, the mean average slip is about 40 centimeters. Uh, and along the path is about 40 centimeters. Average slip uh, in the after slip region is about 10 centimeters. And this is uh, in uh, agreement with uh, slip distribution obtained from uh, SAR uh, images. Again, a further support to the diffusive uh, process is given by the uh, seismic moment time history. You see that seismic moment uh, follows a nearly exponential uh, law up to, to the final value, which is a, about 10% of the main shock seismic moment. Well, of course, uh, uh, a great problem, a major question, uh, is about the possible role of fluid diffusion in driving this uh, slip diffusion, slip diffusive process. Uh, we obtained a diffusion coefficient of about 15,000 square meters per second, which in case of water uh, gives an intrinsic permeability of about 10 to the minus 9 square meters. And this value is uh, uh, large with respect to 10 to the minus 11 square meters, 
uh, which has been obtained uh, for fast water flow uh, through uh, recent active normal faults in the Gansasso area. But however, uh, this uh, discrepancy does not ex exclude the role of fluid diffusion. For example, clearing of fracture filling material close to the fault plane could have uh, occurred. Last uh, uh, slide, we already proposed uh, one dimensional slip propagation similar to heat diffusion in 1999 uh, to explain uh, uh, some features of the slow earthquakes observed in 1997 in the Gran area. Here we give the first observational evidence of diffusion of diffusive slip propagation over the fault. Uh, more details are on a paper in press on geophysical research letters. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. Any questions? We had one. Is there any uh, hope of resolving some of these with uh, uh, interferometry or other geodetic techniques to verify? Uh, interferometric techniques? Uh, you see, there are. Uh, the, okay, sorry. Uh, there is uh, some support for, for these results, uh, but uh, uh, we don't know the details uh, now from uh, post-seismic uh, moving uh, uh, of uh, slipping of the fault just in the Paganica area from uh, local uh, superficial measurements. But, however, mm, uh, we have to, to check for the consistency of those observations with our results. Okay. Thanks. Session continues back here at 140 in the same room.